Hey folks, it's Nate. You might remember that not too long ago I did an Ask Nate video where I asked you guys what you what things you wanted me to answer. And you provided a number of questions. And it went so well, and I think you guys enjoyed the video enough, that I decided to do a second one. So a week and a half or so ago, I went back to the social media and I asked you folks, what do you want to ask me? And I got a couple of questions. So I've got them here on my phone. I'm going to go through them. And, uh, hope you guys enjoy. Alright folks, i got seven questions here on my phone. We're going to try to get through them uh, without spending your whole evening. Hopefully this isn't too long of a video. Alright, number one comes from John via the YouTube post that I made, YouTube community. So, if you want to see these posts, you would need to go subscribe to SWB, SWB Crawler on YouTube, and whenever I make a post, you can read it. So, I have a question about track bars as they pertain to my YJ. It's a good thing I have a lot of experience with YJs, because the track bar on a YJ is a much different beast than the track bar on any newer Jeep. The YJ is lifted, has bigger tires. My question is, I have heard you can flip your Jeep running track bars in rough terrain. I have never flipped one of my SUVs, so I was wondering if this is true, or just a way for folks to justify the extra flex they want. Not sure I want body roll while driving down a windy highway to get to the trail. So, track bars are sort of a, I don't know, heated debate, you might say, in the YJ world. On a TJ or new or anything with coiled and linked suspensions, you need that track bar unless you've gone with a four link. So, caveat number one, do not remove your track bars on a TJ or LJ like this unless you've put a bunch of thought into suspension geometry and actually know you don't need one. Do not take your track bar off of a stock TJ. Bad idea. The YJ, on the other hand, is a leaf spring suspension. Now, leaf springs do a pretty good job of centering the axle under the body all by themselves, which is exactly what a track bar is for. Previous to the YJ, the CJ, no track bars. Leaf spring, leaf spring suspension, I believe the CJ7, maybe the 5, maybe the 6, I don't know. I don't, I don't know CJ as well. Uh, had a sway bar that kept the body roll down. That's mainly what keeps the body roll down on the YJ. The track bar is there to help keep the, the axle centered under the Jeep. The problem with the track bar on a YJ is that the arc of a leaf spring versus the arc of a track bar aren't the same. So it causes binding. And when the vehicle flexes, it'll make the track bar bind with the leaf spring. Now, the track bar does serve some purpose on the YJ in keeping the axle centered underneath the Jeep especially on the front axle, which is your steering axle. On the rear axle, you probably remove the track bar and never really notice. The front axle, you will notice a little bit of steering play if you remove it. Some mechanics will not inspect your Jeep if you do not have the track bar connected. Personally, I use a guy who's pretty lax when it comes to inspecting my vehicles. However, track bar is a thing he always wanted me to have connected when I had my Jeep inspected. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about removing them. Personally, I drove my YJs for years, whether it was spring over, spring under, lifted or not, with no track bars. I found them to be useless. I've also heard some reports of folks that leave their track bar connected on their YJ, and it's actually caused stress fractures in their frame when they're off-road because of the extra articulation and the way it binds between that track bar and the leaf springs. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go ahead and ditch your track bars, but I can say that I drove my YJ, the blue one, which you've seen some of the older videos on this channel, with no track bars for most of its life. In fact, I think I took the track bars off as soon as I put the first lift kit on, which was about a month or two after I purchased the thing. I drove it that way for years, never had a problem. I can't say that I've ever heard of anybody flipping a Jeep because of a track bar uh, disconnected, though. If what you meant to ask was whether you need this sway bar connected or not. And maybe I should clarify what a track bar is versus a sway bar, because maybe you don't know. I don't know. 
track bar goes from the frame to the axle. On the TJ, it runs, I believe, from this side of the frame on a bracket uh, right above the driver's side of the axle down to a bracket on the passenger side of the axle. The YJ was very similar. There's a torx bolt that goes through the thing. It's a real pain in the ass to try to take out on the YJ. Its whole job is to keep the axle centered under the Jeep. So if there's forces going left and right on your axle, like on a steering axle, it'll keep the axle from wandering from left to right as you steer around turns. The sway bar, on the other hand, sole purpose is to limit body roll. That's a bar that runs across the frame. On the YJ, I believe it ran under the frame. And it's sort of a U-shaped bar. And then there's a link that goes from the bar down to a bracket on the axle. It's only on the front axle on the YJ. The TJ has one in the rear as well, which is more of a torsion bar, which allows for flex. But in the front, it's a solid bar that you have to disconnect when you want to go off-road in order to get the flex you might want out of your suspension. On the YJ, or the TJ, any Jeep, to be honest, you can get sway bar disconnects so that you can have the sway bar connected when you're on the road and disconnected when off-road. Or, like I did, you can get the Curry Anti-Rock, sorry, I think they're called the Rock Jock now. You can get the Rock Jock Anti-Rock, or there's other manufacturers, I think Terraflex makes one, and essentially off-road makes another, uh, where it's the, the sway bar has a torsion bar in it in the front, so that when you're hitting turns and stuff, it isn't enough force to make the sway bar... Uh, it isn't enough to make the steering loose, but it is enough to keep the body roll down on the highway. When you're on the trail, on the other hand, there's enough force involved to make that thing flex. I wrote an article years ago on swbcrawler.com, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video, about how the anti-rock performs versus how uh, no sway bar performs when you're on the trail. There is a difference. It helps limit body roll, so you lose a little bit of flex, but it also... Um, makes that body, it makes the flex a little more useful because it makes it more balanced when in, co in cooperation with a rear track bar like I have on the, the LJ behind me here. Track bars, however, uh, yes, they limit flex a little bit. They do not, maybe they do a little, but they do not, to my knowledge, limit flex significantly on the TJ suspension, the coil spring suspension. They're very similar in design to the YJ, so I want to say that it's probably not a big deal, but it, like I said, it can cause binding from what I've heard on the trail. I usually run my YJs with no, with no track bars. Sway bar, yes. On the road, you probably want a sway bar. I've been known to run my YJs with no sway bar, but the leaf spring, it all depends on the leaf springs and what you're used to. If you have very stiff leaf springs, which you're going to know because it's very bouncy and jouncy, um, you may not notice a lot of body roll on the road with the YJ, CJ, and older. The TJ, on the other hand, with no sway bar connected, is very much. It has a lot of body roll, and you definitely want to connect that sway bar when you're on the, on the road, unless you have something like the anti-rock, like I have on this one. So, I hope that answers that question, and we're going to move on to the next one. I've got a series of, I think, three separate questions from uh, a guy named Scott. He goes by Maned Crawler. He came from Instagram. He's got a big beard. I think that's why he goes by the name Maned Crawler. Um, and these were, he told me himself that he already knows the answers, <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and answer them anyway. Uh, so does tire shine make you a mall crawler? I don't know, folks. Listen, if you want your Jeep to look sparkly clean, go ahead. It's your Jeep. Personally, I don't have the time for that crap. Soft shackles or steel? Well, you can see right here, I've got steel shackles or D-rings, whatever you want to call them, on the front of my Jeep. I don't own any soft shackles. I'm not opposed to them. I just don't have any. I like the idea in concept. A soft shackle seems like a good idea as long as you can get a good solid connection to, uh, to a tow point on a bumper like this. Uh, the thing that you want to be sure of, however, is that your recovery point isn't cutting into the soft shackle. I've seen cases where people are worried, right? So on this recovery point, it's just a piece of steel with, uh, let me see this in the camera. No, you can't. On a standard recovery point like I have on my bumper, it's a piece of steel with a big hole drilled through it, and the edges of the steel can sometimes be a little bit sharp. And if that's the case, and you've got a soft shackle, and you've just run it through the, the, the recovery point on your bumper, it could chafe that soft shackle. 
So in that case, you might want to have a steel shackle anyway, a steel D-ring anyway, and uh, run your soft shackle through that. And I realize you guys probably can't see my bumper all that well, but hopefully you get the idea. There's a steel shackle on my bumper that my winch is connected to. Is a sweatshirt an adequate cable blanket? And I think he asked me this just to troll me. So, personally, I don't have a lot of winching experience. That might surprise you, because I've been on the trails for so long. Uh, this is the first winch I've ever owned. Knocking crap over. This worn winch on the front of the LJ is the only winch I've ever owned, and it's really the only experience that I've had winching. I do intend to take a winch training course, so hopefully that question will be answered in depth. However, from what I know, I'm going to give you some, some basics here. Uh, the, when you own a winch and you initially put cable on it, you've got two choices. You have steel, wire, rope. A lot of people call it cable. It's not cable. It's wire, rope. Or you have synthetic rope. Okay, so synthetic rope is lighter, uh, but it has some drawbacks, like it can be damaged by UV and whatnot. One of the definite benefits to a synthetic rope is that if it breaks, and I've seen this in person, if it breaks, it falls to the ground. There's no stored up kinetic energy like in a steel rope. In a wire rope, in a steel wire rope, what you have is the steel stretches slightly when you're, when you're, when you're winching, especially when it's under heavy load. And when it stretches like that, if that wire were to break for some reason, if that wire rope were to snap, it releases all that kinetic energy and it can literally kill people. That's a bad thing. That's a very bad thing. So uh, one way you mitigate that is you put a winch blanket, or uh, maybe there's a better term for that. You put a basically a dampener, a winch dampener, over the line while you're recovering. And the, the point is that if it snaps, uh, that dampener is supposed to take up all that kinetic energy when it snaps. I do not believe a sweatshirt is adequate. However, I have seen some old school folks use things like a sweatshirt or a towel as a dampener for their winch line. Maybe it has some effect, but the right way to do it is to get a weighted winch dampener, which you can buy from Warren or probably a number of other places that don't want to see their customers' heads taken off by snapped winch lines. Okay, the next question, and this one's a little more serious, uh, from Michael on YouTube. I've seen you use cardboard as a medium for making your template. Does it work out well? It's a good question. So. Again, maybe you can't see it out of frame here, but this bumper on the front of the Jeep that I'm literally sitting on at the moment, uh, I built from scratch. If you want to see that, I've got videos I'll link in the description as well, uh, so that you can see the process. The first step in that process was I built the entire bumper out of cardboard, and unfortunately I've thrown away the template that I made. But I made a template that basically went over the top of the, uh, the frame rails, curved down and underneath the way, I, the way I envisioned that the bumper would fit. If you're really good with steel, or if you have a lot of steel to work with, or if it's really easy for you to cut and bend steel, you can certainly do all that with steel instead of doing it with cardboard. In my case, I don't have a shop set up that will easily modify steel. So what I do is I build it out of cardboard before I build it out of steel, because cardboard is cheap, it's easy to work with, it's easy to just run it down with a, with a utility knife and score it and bend it in ways that I want that's hard to do with steel. So in my case, yes, building a bumper out of, out of cardboard before I built it out of steel has worked out extremely well. If you have any kind of a crazy bracket you wanna build, trace it on cardboard and cut it out. Make all the fitments that you need and then figure out how to do it out of steel. It just makes things so much easier. So yes, Michael, it does work out well. And I think uh, if you're gonna, especially if you're just learning how to fabricate with steel, I highly recommend it. Either get some nice corrugated cardboard, some, some, of the, some of the thicker stuff that better represents the thickness of the steel you're gonna work with, or heck, just get some poster board. Anything thick enough that it's gonna make a decently straight line, right? It's gonna maintain its shape when you cut it out so you can figure out what's, what shape you wanna build. Then you can literally take the cardboard, trace it on steel and cut it out, and you're, you're part of the way done with your bumper already or whatever you're building. The next one comes from the Bearded Jeeper. If you guys don't know the Bearded Jeeper, you should check out his YouTube channel. I believe he commented on my YouTube post, but I didn't note it because he and I are friends on every social media channel that we're both on. So check him out. Kyle at the Bearded Jeeper. He's got a good channel. He's a good guy. He asks, what's your favorite mod you've ever done to your Jeep? 
My favorite mod... So, I'm going to say there's two things that I really want to say are my favorite mods to this Jeep, okay? Uh, the first, I would say, is this bumper. I'm really proud that I built this thing. I'll, I'll, I'll get a picture of it or something so you guys can see because I think it's out of frame here. But uh, I spent a lot of time designing and building this bumper. And I, I built it on video for you guys to see. And I really love how it came out. At the end of it, I bought this winch to put on top of it, and I just love how the whole thing worked out. Uh, I really love this bumper. However, it's not a mod that I purchased, so I wanted to also talk about my favorite mod that I spent money on. So the favorite mod that I have purchased for my Jeep LJ has got to be my Curry Anti-Rock. Now, I realize that they're no longer Curry Anti-Rock, it's a Rock Jock Anti-Rock, and I've mentioned it earlier in this video already, uh, but the Anti-Rock is a great sway bar, and I love the thing, and it has transformed this Jeep, I think, into a very stable and very off-roadable vehicle um, for not a terrible amount of money. I want to say the Anti-Rock is 300 350 something like that. Not cheap when you consider sway bar disconnects are around $100, um, and this is basically a competitor to that. However, night and day difference. Um, if you have a factory sway bar that you use disconnects on and you've been considering the anti-rock. Maybe I'll make a separate video on just how I like the anti-rock. Uh, like I mentioned before, I did do an article about the anti-rock and how it limits flex and whatnot, and that will be, as I mentioned before, linked in the description of this video. So, that's probably my favorite mod that I've purchased. Favorite mod that I've got on the Jeep has got to be the bumper, and that's just because I'm so proud of the fact that I built the thing and that it's now on the Jeep, and, well, I, I just like it. I, I love how it looks, and I love everything about it. So, last question, hopefully. This is from Dennis on YouTube as well. O1TJ, currently running stock Dana 30 and 44, 373 gears, 5.5 inch long arm lift kit with 35 inch tires. Should I re-gear to 456 or look for Rubicon axles? Super low budget. Uh, new axles would give lockers, but 410 gears and, and be used, and be used, right. Any thoughts? 4.0 with a 5-speed. Um, I'm going to say, first of all, with a 5-speed, with a manual transmission, I feel like gears are much more noticeable of an improvement. With the auto, I've noticed in this thing, maybe it's because it's got 373s, but with the auto, I've noticed that... Um, when I upped the tire size, I didn't notice the loss of power like I did when I was in a manual transmission in the old YJ, and I upped from 31s to 33s. And I think that's because the automatic transmission just kind of eats it up. You punch the gas, it goes places, right? So uh, with the manual, I'm going to say that the, the re-gearing is a much more noticeable thing, and I highly recommend it for anyone who's got larger tires and gears that may not be matched to the size tire you have. Now, I didn't go look up what the optimal gear ratio range is for 35-inch tires, but I want to say it's around 456 or 488. And that comes down to the optimal RPM and torque range of the 4.0. Now, obviously, your transmission plays into that a little bit. You want to stay in that power band of your engine when you're on the highway. When you're on the trails, it makes it a lot easier to crawl over things without stalling out the engine, right? And that's obviously a good thing. With a manual, again, that's a lot more noticeable because you're playing with the clutch to try to keep things going. You're going to burn out clutches faster, and uh, it's just a lot easier to stall a manual transmission on a trail than it is an automatic transmission because you got that torque converter in there making magic happen when you're in an auto. This Jeep's an auto. 373 gears on the 33s, it's working okay. I haven't really thought, I haven't really felt like I needed to re-gear. With the YJ, I had 307 gears from the factory, and 33s was almost unbearable. When I went to 410s, it was night and day difference. So I'm going to say, yes, you should re-gear. However, you asked about the axles. The Data 30 has a much smaller ring gear, and I didn't look up the actual numbers before I recorded this because I'm kind of like, I just had a last minute idea, I'm going to record this video. The smaller ring and pinion mean that you have, so the thing you have to consider is tooth engagement in between the ring and pinion. So you've got the ring gear spinning, right, and then the pinion gear that comes in, right? 
the pinion gear meshes with the ring gear, sort of like this. My awesome uh, finger uh, <laughs> meshing here. Uh, a higher gear ratio, numerically higher, uh, lower gear ratio, means that you're going to have more teeth on the ring and pinion gear. Okay? The more teeth, the less engagement you get per uh, revolution, you know, where the, where the two gears meet. Okay? There's a point where you only get one or two teeth of engagement. And that's not really a good thing, because that actually makes that piece of your drivetrain a lot weaker. 456 might be close to that limit on the Dana 30. I know the Dana 30 has an upper limit as to where it can, where you can get lower gears, and that limit might be something like 488. Again, I didn't look this up, but I know 456 might be pushing that. I know people that have run 456s in a Dana 30, but there's a lot of other things to consider if you're on 35s. The Dana 30 just isn't a very strong axle. If you intend to lock it, ever, those 35s are probably going to destroy those axle shafts. Or the housing. I've seen Data 30 housings snap in half. Bearded Jeeper that I mentioned earlier, he did this. So, um, if you're going to wheel it, which I assume you are, otherwise, you know, maybe you wouldn't be watching this channel. If you're going to wheel it, I would highly recommend a stronger front axle. Now, the TJ Rubicon axles are an okay thing to swap into because they bolt straight into the, the TJ. You said you have an 01 TJ. Uh, they'll bolt, they'll, it'll, it'll bolt straight in. The locker may take some, some work to make work properly. It is an air actuated locker, but it takes a tiny little bit of pressure to actuate. So there may be some work that has to be done there to make that work, unless you're gonna swap in a different locker. Maybe you go with an ARB, whatever. You did say the budget is low, so I'm gonna imagine that if you're gonna get a Rubicon front axle, you're just gonna run it the way it comes. So there may be some things to look into there to make that air actuated locker actually work properly. Personally, what I'm looking for, and I say this as I have a set of Dana 60s literally laying next to the tripod that the camera is on, what I want to do is put some JK Dana 44s under this Jeep. And I'll let you in on a few reasons as to why that is. One is width. These Dana 60s are full width out of a Ford F-150, F-250. They're wide. They're too wide for the LJ, and that's because, uh, well, you know, the full width, full width of a pickup truck. Uh, in Pennsylvania, where I am, that's a problem. And the reason that's a problem is because we're crazy here about tire coverage and flare width. So you make a Jeep too wide, you can't cover the tires anymore with the flares, but you have to cover the tires because that's the law. Uh, but anyway, that may not affect you. What I want to do is put the JK axles under here, which will be a little easier to cover than the full width axles. Narrowing the full width axles is going to be a pain in the ass. So my plan would be to get some Dana 44s out of a JK Rubicon because they're stronger than the TJ Rubicon axles. Now, you have another option. You did say budget was tight, but I'm just giving you all the options that are out there. You can go to a company like Dynatrack or G2 Axle and Gear and get a Dana 44 front axle for the TJ that's already the right width. Literally bolts in and you're done. It's not designed like the, the TJ Rubicon Dana 44. It has some improvements to make it better. Or, if you get a TJ Dana 44, obviously it's going to be better than the, than, the, than the Dana 30, but only in some respects. The outers, the knuckles, and where the tires mount, the unit bearings, the outer shafts, those are all Dana 30. They're all the same as the Dana 30. So you don't gain a lot of strength there. You do get strength on the inner side. The housing's a little beefier. Um, the C's are known to bend. That's a problem. Again, the JK44 solves some of these. The JK44 also has a beefier ring and pinion gear because it's a newer generation of the Dana 44. Personally, I think it's a good swap. Dana, JK Dana 44's trust, maybe sleeved, although the jury's at as to whether sleeving really helps anything or not. Uh, get them trust, put some nice strong axle shafts in them, maybe replace the locker, maybe run with the JK locker that's already in there, and off you go, right? So that's my opinion. Uh, I'm not going to say that that's the best way to go budget-wise, because a set of JK 44s might run you four or five grand, which ain't cheap. If you're really on a tight budget, and you don't want to have to swap axles, you don't want to go down the, the, the Dynatrack or the G2 axle and gear, or the Curries or whatever, that you can get a crate axle that'll fit underneath your Jeep, because that's a little too expensive. 
what you could do is get a truss for your Dana 30. You still have the gear limitation. You don't want to go too deep with the gears because you have that tooth engagement problem that I talked about. You can get stronger shafts so you can wheel the thing and not break shafts. These are ways to go. However, you still have a Dana 30 at the end of the day. The housing is still only so strong and that ring and pinion is going to be your weak point. So these are all things that you need to consider if you are thinking about if you're thinking about wheeling anything hardcore on a Dana 30. I still have a Dana 30 on this on 33s. It's open though, not locked. If you keep it open, you have a less chance of breaking it. But if you're trying to do harder trails, you're going to want to lock. So these are all things that you just need to know. The bottom line is it comes down to how you're going to wheel this Jeep and what you intend to do with it. If you're going to drive it on the street all day long, keep the Dana 30. There's really no reason to upgrade. If you're going to go wheel it in the rocks and do black trails, the Dana 30 is eventually going to give you trouble. Maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's years from now. It all depends on you and your wheeling style. If you're light on the, if you're light on the gas pedal, maybe you never break it. Maybe you don't lock it. You choose to leave it open. You lock the rear axle instead. Um, and then the, the Dana 30 in the front has a little bit less stress on it because there's no locker involved. These are all things that you can consider to try to prolong the length of the life of that Dana 30. I would not, in my opinion, I wouldn't gear it lower than 456. Maybe you can get away with 488. I don't think they even offer gears any lower than that because of that tooth engagement problem that I was talking about. Eventually you get so low that you just can't do it. It won't fit in the, uh, in the carrier of the Dana 30. So I hope that answers your question. I rambled around for a little bit, but uh, hopefully this helps folks and you can get some information out of that. And I think that's all the questions that I had for tonight. Look at that. I'm at the end of the list. So. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you like these things. If you do like them, I'll keep doing them. Um, I enjoy it because it lets me share information for things that maybe I wasn't thinking about sharing otherwise. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff rattling around in this brain from 20 years of sitting around campfires with folks who knew more than me. So I'm happy to share it with you guys. So feel free to keep asking Nate questions. And Nate will keep making these videos to answer your questions. So with that, I'm gonna say thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please like it with the little thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you know when I, when I uh, post new videos. And that's it folks. Remember, get out there and wheel and I'll catch you in the next video. Uh, 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 uh.